morning. Today's Thursday. Tomorrow's Good Friday. For, for a couple of weeks, we've been looking at the words that Jesus said from the time of his arrest to um, the time he died on the cross. And we're getting close. And I wonder if there's a gravity growing in your chest again as we hold both the sorrow of the cross and the victory of the empty tomb. You know, Jesus, in the words we're about to hear, never seems more human and never seems more divine all at the same time. As he just says the simple words, I'm thirsty. John records it like this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished. Think about that. Let's talk about that first. Knowing that all was now finished. This has to do with time and space and eternity and the entire universe. All was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture. So not only is this having to do with the whole ball of wax, time and space, and the whole universe, but it also has to do with all of the Old Testament expectation that the Messiah would fulfill that prophetic urge, that prophetic cry, that prophetic expectation of a Messiah. I thirst. Man, that's so personal. This has to do with the whole ball of wax life and death and eternity and all of that stuff and it also has to do with just the simple cry of thirst a jar full of sour wine stood there so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth and when jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit knowing that everything had been fulfilled what does he mean by everything? What does he mean by all had been fulfilled? Man, we're talking about the reverse of the original curse. We're going all the way back to Genesis 2 and 3. We're going back to the fall of man and saying that is finished. It's fulfilled. Knowing that the separation between man and God, the curtain has been torn. The sin separation that, that keeps man and God apart is no longer a problem for those that just look to Christ. That is finished. It is over. There's victory over sin and death. He has won the victory. Blood must be paid, and now blood has been shed of the sinless man. All has been fulfilled. He's doing what Adam couldn't do. Adam was given the opportunity to walk with God in love and joy and refused instead sought after his own heart and his own desire and, and his own desire to be, be like God. It's the beginning of a brand new race of people as Jesus is on the cross and said it's fulfilled. He's established a new family in his name. You and I are members, citizens of heaven, members of the family of God because of the work of the cross. It has been fulfilled, all of it. The payment for our sin has been made. God's wrath has been satisfied. As Jesus hangs on the cross, he is aware of exactly who he is and exactly what he's doing. He is bearing the, the burden of our sins and he has done it. There is victory in this death and it has to do with the whole broken system. He says, it also says, he, he said this to fulfill scripture. Psalm 22, again, Jesus taking us back to the psalm. Psalm 22 said, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. This describes what Jesus is going through on the cross. It is melted within my breast, and my chest, and my strength is dried up like potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the death of dust. Psalm 69, uh, 21 says, They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. This is on Jesus' mind. Jesus knows exactly who he is. He is the Messiah that the prophets were looking towards. He knew what he was doing, paying the price for sin and death. He was there on purpose. And make no mistake, it was for the joy set before him that Christ endured the cross. This was no easy task. This was physical torture and death. We get the word excruciating from the word crucifixion. Jesus, the man, went through this on purpose so that he could be the sacrifice for your sin and mine. So he could fulfill 
the Old Testament prophecy so he could solve the only problem that really exists, the problem of sin and death. This is big stuff. This is wide stuff. But all of that, the brokenness of the entire universe, all of time and space, came down to the physical suffering of one man, came down to the physical suffering of Jesus. Never was there more a more human cry than simply, I'm thirsty. I, uh, of, of all of the sayings of Jesus, sometimes this one breaks my heart the most because I don't know if you've experienced extreme thirst, but I, I haven't. I mean, I've gotten so dehydrated I had a headache or so dehydrated I was nauseous. I've, I've felt that my tongue, you know, stick into the roof of my mouth because I'm so thirsty. But do you remember the day that Jesus has had? He's been beaten. He's lost blood. He's been, yeah, nails have been um, put through his hands. You remember he was offered a drink one more time right when they first crucified him, and it was mixed with myrrh and gall. Myrrh was a painkiller, and gall was poison. So it was an opportunity for Jesus if he wanted to dull the pain and to die sooner, and he rejected it, said, no, I'm going to bear this burden. And so he had rejected that. He'd had nothing to drink, and the physical pain, think of his head pounding, think of the ache in his body as he just says, I'm thirsty. He had been mocked with wine. You know, it's right to say that we must join Christ in his suffering. And I think as we see this crucified Savior, one thing we take away is we probably shouldn't anticipate that following him will include no suffering or sorrow. The same world that rejected Jesus is still here to reject those that follow him. And yet, if we think about joining in Christ's suffering, we need to be sure that that does not in any way limit the suffering of Jesus in our minds. You know, I might suffer because of sin. I might suffer because of my sin, because I'm dumb and I do dumb things and, and there's some suffering involved there, or because of the sin of other people. Or I might suffer because of societal sin. That's all true. I might suffer because of sin, but I will never suffer for my sin. Jesus made the sacrifice for my sin. So while I'll experience pain and sorrow, I will never experience the ultimate pain and sorrow and suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross. Even the thieves next to him on the cross who were also crucified did not experience being the payment for the solution to sin and death. For you and me, we're saved from this ultimate suffering by the ultimate act of suffering of Jesus on the cross. So would you give yourself to him today? His sacrifice needs to motivate us to obey like him, obey like he obeyed. It needs to motivate us to give like he gave. It mo needs to motivate us to, to love like he loved. And it needs to motivate us to joy that he paid a price I don't have to pay because I've been bought and sold by the blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb of God. So this weekend as we celebrate Good Friday and as we celebrate Easter, even though we're not going to be able to celebrate them physically together, let's with united hearts remember, celebrate, and live like Jesus.